So very briefly, our readings today show us quite a few things, but one that stands out in particular is the need and the way to humility. Humility is the opposite of pride, and pride is the beginning of all sin, says Ecclesiasticus. Pride is the inordinate desire for one's own excellence, and humility is the opposite. Humility is seeking one's own excellence in a proper manner and degree. See, we are not allowed to neglect our own excellence. We have an obligation to seek our own excellence, but in the way and in the manner that God has ordained. We have to try to be what we are made for. That's humility, and we don't get to heaven without it. Well, what are we made for? To know, love, and serve God in this world and to be happy with him forever in heaven. Well, heaven is the goal. That's what we're made for. That is when we will be perfect. It's one thing that we can see in St. Paul's words today. Do your job. Do what God has called you to, and you will be holy. But St. Paul does not tell us how to know what God is asking of us. He points out that there are many different vocations. But he does not tell us how to find our vocation. We do get a glimpse of that in the gospel, though. The humble man prays. He prays with confidence. He's not imposing his will on God. He is open to the will of God in his life. He admits his failures, and he expects God's help. Note that. True humility expects help from God. Otherwise, it is not really humility. So prayer and confident reliance on God are important so that we can do what we need to do to get to heaven. And what is it that we need to do? St. Paul tells us that there are many parts, many jobs, but one end, one goal for us all. How do we know which job is right for us? There are some general guidelines that can apply to everyone, those seeking their vocation still and those living their vocations. St. Alphonsus, the Church's doctor on moral theology, assures us that a religious vocation is the shortest and surest way to heaven. If heaven is the goal, then we all have an obligation to seek the surest means of getting there. We are not free to take chances with our eternal salvation. So does that mean that everyone is supposed to be a monk or a nun? No. Just because something is the best in itself does not mean that it is the best for everyone. A golden jeweled crucifix is objectively superior. It's better than a bare wooden cross with no crucified Lord on it. But the Jesuit missionaries going to China knew better than to show the Chinese a dead body. Such a thing was considered a curse to them in their culture and the Chinese would never have come near the Jesuits, much less listened to them. What was best in this case was to not use what is objectively best, at least not until they were ready for it. So if a vocation to the religious life is the best vocation, the highest calling, everyone should at least consider a vocation to religious life unless they are already sure of their vocation to something else. To those who are married, we will talk another time, but this is still good to hear, to understand these principles. Our Lord shows us the difference today in the gospel between those who are interested in saving their souls and those who are interested in pleasing the world. If you will do what you are supposed to do, it will not matter if you are a publican or a priest. You can be holier than the Pope himself if he's not doing his job and you are doing your job, whatever your job is. Doing the will of God for you is what matters. We all have the same calling to get to heaven, but we are all different. If someone, for example, has a Jeep to go over a mountain, he can get there in a pretty straight line, just up and over. 
But if someone else has a Cadillac, he'd better go around the mountain. He had better not try going over it. It may not be as straight a path, but it is a better path. It is a more sure path for the Cadillac. Until you're sure of what kind of vehicle you're driving, it has to be assumed that the most direct path is the one to take. For heaven is the goal, and getting sidetracked can be deadly. Your Jeep is going to get horrible gas mileage out on the long highway around the mountain. It might overheat, and with all the beautiful things there are to see along the way, the gas tank in a Jeep just isn't going to hold enough to get you where you need to go. In other words, until someone is sure of his vocation, he or she has a duty to investigate the religious life because it is the most certain way. Such a life separates one from the rest of the world and allows us to focus more on heaven and more on overcoming our greatest enemy, which, of course, is ourselves. A religious vocation is that straight path the shortest path to our goal. You have to look at it first before even looking down the road, the other roads, because we do know that the beautiful road has so many joys and beautiful things along it that it's always going to be attractive. If you discover that the religious life is not for you, the other path will still be attractive. If you find that the shortest path is not for you, there will be no trouble in falling in love with that other path. If, on the other hand, you start down that beautiful and attractive path, it would be really hard to turn back and take that steep and difficult path that is more sure. So all of you young men and women, this is why you have to leave the dating thing alone. Treat the opposite sex totally, like brothers or sisters, until you are sure of what your vocation is. The attraction is so great and so beautiful that if it is not properly handled, it will become a dangerous attraction and maybe even eventually a vice, which will enslave you. Think about, for example, your favorite food or, or sports or your favorite hobby. It's a good thing, but if you eat too much, or play the games too much, can make you sick, or you can spend time doing that instead of important things that need to get done. This, by the way, is one reason for doing penance. Penance helps us keep those things in perspective so that we are in control of ourselves and other things are not. No one will be virtuous without penance. But the beauty of the married vocation is so attractive that if you start to enjoy some of that beauty before you are actually married, it will interfere with your decision-making process. The attraction is fine. It's a good and a beautiful and a wholesome thing given by God. He wants us to be happy in this life. But what we do with that attraction is what matters. And be sure, then, that you're doing penance so that you can remain in possession of yourself You can remain free to say yes or no with equal ease to anything that comes along and not let beautiful things turn into an enslaving vice in your life. Investigate and test, if necessary, your vocation to religious life first. The other vocations, they all require prayer and discernment, but they are still open to you, and you can choose them freely if you have remained free. Comparing the two lives is not the way to do it. The beauty of marriage is always going to draw you very strongly, and the beauty of the religious life is not as obvious. It's not a fair comparison. So how to keep things in focus so that you don't miss what your vocation may be? Well, we already talked about penance, and that is just so important. Our Lord says that unless you convert and do penance, you will perish. Well, of course, that means what we already said. We want to be able to focus on what is important and not be distracted. And our Lord also tells us, as we all know, that we can do nothing without him. And so we must pray. 
St. Augustine tells us that God gives his help only to those who ask him. He does not need to hear our own, our needs from us. He already knows them. But we do have a need to ask for his help. So in addition to penance, we have to pray to know our vocation. Every day, God grant that I should know my vocation when the time comes. Parents and grandparents, teach your children to pray this prayer every day from the day they first begin to pray. It will certainly pay off. So to know our vocations, we have prayer and penance. Prayer to gain grace to know and penance so that we can see clearly and choose freely. But God gives us more help than even this. He gives us his church and the words of those who are chosen to represent him in this world. He gives us confessors, priests, who should be men of prayer, and men disposed to be the instruments of God, men with the grace to give direction in such matters, men who are our spiritual fathers. Seek the advice of a good confessor to help you know your vocation. This is a big decision. Take counsel with your spiritual father. There are eternal ramifications to this decision, for from it will flow many, many other decisions. And do we have the grace to make those decisions and live with the consequences? Ask the opinion of someone who has the grace to help you answer, to help you know. You want someone with your eternal interests in mind to get to know you and to help you figure out what sorts of decisions are you best disposed to making well. Your natural parents the ones who gave you life. They're wonderful people, and they love you a lot. And certainly, they want you to get to heaven. But naturally, they are also caught up with some other interests. Your temporal welfare and your temporal happiness. And sometimes to such an extent that it interferes with their judgment of what may be best for your vocation. This is why St. Alphonsus says that oftentimes it is not wise to tell your parents that you are considering a religious vocation. They have a vested interest in your being around for the rest of their lives. It's not natural for a child to leave the world before his parents. Priests see this often enough. Parents who love their children and don't want to be separated from them are heartbroken and sometimes so much so that they will interfere with their child's choice to answer God's call to religion. It sounds crazy. We know. They're choosing heaven. It's the best thing. But when the time comes, that attachment may be so great that it creates problems. But a good confessor will help you share with your parents the right time to share that news. This is the gift of a good confessor. It's good advice on the most important decisions you will make in life. And it's free. But you need to pray also for your confessors. See, God has a plan for you from all eternity. He has loved you since before the universe was created. And he knew you for as long as he himself has existed. He knows what is best for you. Please ask him about his plan for you. With prayer and penance and discussion with your confessor, your vocation will become clear. You will know. But it takes perseverance. It can't be an occasional prayer. You can't show up at 22 years old and suddenly decide, gee, I wonder what God wants me to do. I better find out. Well, if that's the first time you think of it, then yes, you'd better start finding out. But each and every one of us needs to start today no matter how old you are. If this is all new to you, it does not matter how old you are. Start today. Parents and grandparents, start your children and grandchildren from the day they first learn to pray. Teach them to pray. God, show me my vocation so that I may please thee and to save my soul, to be happy with you forever in heaven. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.